Okay, one of the reasons that I find it regrettable, and I, I might have to say at the outset, I'm no economist. I don't write about economics, so I'm partly what I was faulting earlier, privacy scholars who don't take economics very seriously. I don't just because I don't have the toolkit to do it well. Um, but I will say that one of the reasons I find it somewhat regrettable that we don't talk about economics enough is we are letting waves of generations of interesting new advances in economics go unnoticed and undiscussed in privacy debates. Now, it's a bit of an overstatement, because there are plenty of people who pay attention to these things. Uh, Christine Jaws, who isn't here, uh, is, a, is a wonderful behavioral economist who thinks about privacy quite a bit. Um, but to my mind, new institutional economics, behavioral economics, there are trends that we should begin to appreciate um, and um, incorporate. And this all started for me uh, with thinking about Alessandro Acquisti, our first speaker. Alessandro Acquisti uh, is a professor at Carnegie Mellon's um, uh, uh, Scilab and Public Policy School. Sorry about that. Um, and I've seen Alessandro now on many occasions uh, recite for audiences the series of studies he's managed to do testing our psychological responses to conditions of information privacy. And although every law professor in this field knows Alessandro's work, I thought we've never really taken the moment to look at it all, or a lot of it, in one setting, to try and put that into print, and to try and really take a moment and ask, what does Acquisti's work mean for the questions that we're asking? Um, and so in many ways, for me, this conference began as, let's give Alessandro the first keynote, um, and let's, let's introduce his work. And I'm sure some in the audience don't know a lot of this work. Um, and so that's kind of the purpose of this opening keynote. We're going to invite him onto the first panel as well. So I may limit the questions we get after the speech itself. Um, but I really thought this was the best way to start this discussion of the economics of privacy. And so without further ado, Alessandro, would you please come up and share your insights? Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. May, may I indeed uh, start by, and I believe I'm talking uh, for everyone, thanking Paul Holm for being such a wonderful host uh, researcher in this area and uh, organizer of what, aside from the opening speaker, sounds like a terrific uh, event. Um, and just after thanking him, I will also start, continue by blaming him for um, posing a question that no sane, uh, sober, card-carrying economist w should dare address, which is the failures in the market for privacy. We, we have two pretty ambiguous terms. One somewhat ambiguous, the other extremely ambiguous. The somewhat ambiguous is market failure in the sense that, well, there are some good definitions, uh, and then there are some terrible definitions that you can find around. So you go from market outcomes, which are, which are not Pareto efficient, which is close enough to a good definition, to any market outcome that you just happen not to like. And that's a market failure for you. <laughs> Privacy, even worse here. Um, I'm preaching to the choir here. We have uh, so many different definitions. Sometimes when we work on the economics of privacy, we are not careful in stating exactly which angle we are tackling. So I'll try to <clears throat> frame uh, the issues somewhat differently uh, to uh, not unambiguous, but perhaps slightly less ambiguous questions, which are, can market forces adequately protect information privacy? But then, of course, to what extent, what extent is a protection of privacy adequate? In other words, how much do we really, where do we really want to find the balance between information sharing and uh, information protection? Now, the second question itself is crucial. It's very, very important, but it is also kind of radioactive in the sense that it's, uh, if you try just to answer it in pure economic terms, it would take uh, hours and hours only to discuss that question. So I will leave it aside for the moment. I will not enter the issue of uh, the quantification of the costs and benefits of privacy, but I will focus instead on uh, the issue of uh, can market forces adequately protect information privacy if we believe that it has to be protected. And uh, I will present some evidence from theory and from the empirics of privacy. And you may be surprised to hear that the answer, especially which comes from the theory of economics of privacy, or whether can market forces adequately protect information privacy, 
it's a resounding, it depends. <laughs> Which may not be surprising, economists always say it depends. There are caveats, right? So these are the caveats that I'm going to present to you. The pioneer, the absolute pioneers, the ones who did the seminal work in this area, happen to be Chicago school economists. Uh, economists and law scholars such as Posner and Stigler. Uh, we are talking about literature coming from the late 1970s, early 1980s, which I don't feel I would be too unfair in uh, defining as uh, against privacy. Uh, the idea being that privacy, by taking away information from the marketplace, creates inefficiencies in the marketplace. These inefficiencies, in fact, can, for instance, redistribute wealth uh, from certain players to other players. From the bad worker who has a drug habit, but because of privacy regulation, uh, uh, the employee doesn't know this, and therefore there is a transfer of wealth from uh, the good employee who doesn't have the drug habit to the bad one if the, uh, uh, if the employer cannot, for instance, institute drug testing. Uh, in fact, having regulation is a best ineffective or a worse uh, creates even more inefficiencies or we simply don't need it because just let the market work and uh, challenging, channeling cost theorem there will be a nice uh, proper adequate balance based on how much the potential data holders value the information about data subjects and how much the data subjects value their privacy. So this seems rather intuitive, right? right? That if you take information away from the marketplace, which is in a way what privacy can be seen through economic lenses, you create inefficiencies. But in fact, uh, that's not fully true in the sense that there are many other researchers in this area who have uh, still within the framework of uh, perfectly competitive market or monopoly with a fully informed, rational, economically, neoclassically uh, uh, rational agents who have shown that actually the lack of privacy protection creates inefficiencies. And when there is privacy regulation, those inefficiencies can uh, be eliminated or at least uh, softened. So we have, for instance, works starting back in the late, uh, early 1970, Irsch Leifer, the private benefits of information acquisition, how to waste the social benefits. So, if you let the market try to invest into gathering personal data, it will, try, it will tend to over-invest, uh, invest more than socially optimal. You have the role of negative externalities connected to the secondary usage, usage of data. Maybe the marketplace creates a good balance between protection and sharing when data subjects and data holders are interacting with each other, but the data subjects of, of the, often do not know how else the data holders will exploit the data and they can create negative externalities. You have competition which tailors similar result to Erich Leifer, competition pushing firms to invest more than socially optimum. You have also the result by Erwali and Katz at Berkeley, the regulatory data protection can have exante welfare increasing effects. So bottom line here, you can, without privacy protection, the competitive equilibrium can be Pareto inefficient. With privacy protection, you can get into Pareto efficient equilibrium. Plus, you have other streams of studies related, some of the same uh, authors, which suggest that yes, there is a redistribution due to privacy, but not in the sense Posner was referring to. Posner was talking about redistribution from the bad economic agent, sorry, from the good economic agent to the bad economic agent, because privacy uh, doesn't allow the other, the principal, to have enough information about the agent. But in fact, there is another form of redistribution from the data subject to the data holder. Unless consumers are fully rational in the canonical neoclassical sense, uh, Bayesian updater, uh, utility maximizer, forward-looking, unless we have this type of economic agent, what happens in certain models is that the merchant or the data holder extracts all the surplus away from the transaction with the consumer. Uh, think, it, think about this, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, dynamic price discrimination. The data holder, by doing transaction with the data subject, learns the taste, the consumer type, the preferences of the agent, and then is able to price discriminate the agent and extract all the surplus away from the transaction. So this is what the theory says. 
And this brings up an important issue, whether we can in fact talk about uh, fully rational agents in the canonical neoclassic economic sense when it comes to privacy. And this is what of my, most of my research has uh, focused on. Uh, in order to uh, uh, motivate uh, my research, I I'll reuse, uh, I'm recycling some slides from a few years ago. This is kind of a vignette. But I'm not making fun of anyone here except, you know, in fact, myself, because in the models I was also working on on the economics of privacy, I was also using the kind of uh, strong assumptions about behavior that I've just described. Do they hold true? Are these uh, honest assumptions? Well, let's imagine that there is Johnny in my space, who has some uh, particular sexual kinks that is too early in the morning to discuss, but he's thinking about whether he should reveal them on his profile. And you see that I'm recycling the slides because I'm talking about my space, not Facebook, right? <laughs> and he's thinking, well, okay, it's cost and benefits, right? Because if I talk about my kinks, maybe I will find a lover who will share exactly these kinks. However, maybe my future employer will find this information, maybe my parents will find this information. So how do I solve this? Well, of course. <laughs> Johnny my space will find uh, the optimal balance between the cost and benefits of protecting and revealing data, will optimize its function, its counter utility over time, and will find this sweet balance. Now, if you're laughing, it means that you believe, like me, that there are lots of problems with that description. Um, the behavior economics of privacy is about taking lessons from behavior economics and applying them to privacy decision making. Trying to understand, as I've tried to do for the past few years, what happens in the market for privacy when A, consumers don't always know that their data is being gathered. If it's gathered, how will be used? If it's used, if it's used with what consequences? B, even if subjects have complete information about everything which happens to them, do they have the cognitive power? And I'm using the boundary rationality terms in the original Herbert Simon coinage. Do they have the cognitive power to think through all the possible consequences of protecting or revealing data? And C, even if they had complete information and unbounded processing power, may they fall for well-known cognitive behavioral biases, from optimism bias to hyperbolic discounting, which behavior economists have discussed and studied for many, many years. And these are, I believe, policy-wise, very, very important issues. Because especially in the United States, we have taken an approach to dealing with privacy problems, which is mostly focused on self-regulation. Of the famous OECD privacy guidelines, we seem to remember only the first two, the ones that in the OECD language are openness and individual participation. In our language, we could call them notification or notice and consent or choice or control. And we seem to often forget that there are many other guidelines which, at least originally, in the view of those who scripted, drafted those guidelines, were perhaps to be protected through regulation. But in fact, uh, without those, the first two are only necessary but not sufficient condition for privacy protection. And let me give you some examples here. I believe that the evidence, the academic evidence, to suggest that alone, neither notification or control are enough to protect privacy is uh, ample. Notification, privacy policies. No one reads them. If they read them, few people can understand them, or at least not enough can understand them. In fact, many people misinterpret the role and meaning and significance of a privacy policy. In fact, and here I'm quoting work by Lori Crenor, who is in the room, if we took the approach of uh, privacy policies and notification and consent seriously, we would have to face the opportunity cost of American internet users actually reading the policies, and the opportunity cost in terms of time wasted would be close to two-thirds of a trillion dollar a year. And you know what? Even if you read, that may not be enough, because, and this is just the recent news from yesterday, there was this... Uh, Amazon case, uh, the court apparently dismissed this lawsuit against Amazon, which had intentionally bypassed uh, through uh, P3P the, the, the protection that uh, um, users of Internet Explorer wanted and, and expressed through their uh, privacy preferences, explicitly bypassed by Amazon, the court dismissed the case. 
What about control? Well, maybe the value that control gives to privacy is more illusory than real. And what I'm referring to here, I'm referring to the fact that in the literature on privacy, we used to think of control over personal information as a means to achieve privacy, or in fact as privacy itself. Now I'm going to bring up again uh, the eco economist in me and differentiate between a normative statement and a positive statement. And I would argue that control and privacy is uh, normatively speaking a good thing to say in the sense that it's how the world should be. We should give control to people. In positive terms, how the world really is, what if more control leads to less privacy? And of course I'm using pretty bold terms here. So let me uh, constrain and uh, delimit what I'm talking about. The possibility that by making subjects feel more in control of their data, they end up taking more risk with their data and they end up revealing more sensitive information to more strangers. And just to give you a very quick sample of the kind of work we do when we try to do experiments with human subjects, I will show you just two conditions of a uh, multi-conditional multi experiment Itself, the experiment is just one experiment of uh, probably six or seven we have run in this area. In my field, when we try to publish this kind of work, uh, we have to run several, several experiments in order to convince reviewers that we really found an effect. And here, what we wanted to see was the paradoxical effect that giving more control on their data can have on people's propensity to reveal personal information. So in our case, subjects had to answer some questions online, some sensitive, some not particularly sensitive, and they were randomly assigned to different conditions of uh, this survey. They didn't know, of course, uh, that this was happening. And they were told, uh, look, no answer is mandatory, but if you do answer, your answers anonymously will be published in the appendix to our research. So there was a form of control. We didn't force them to answer, but it was implicit. If you don't want to be published, don't answer. To another group of subjects, we added an explicit button, a checkbox, saying if, if you want to give us permission to publish, check that box. Now, status quo bias will suggest that most of the subjects will not spend the time checking the box. It's a small but non-zero cognitive cost. Instead, we predicted that the opposite would happen, that by making the subjects feel more empowered, we would have not just the subjects ticking on the box, but even them having, more, having them more likely to actually answer the questions. And this is exactly what happened. So here we have the two conditions, implicit and explicit control. I'm segmenting the less intrusive questions and the more intrusive questions. And I have on the y-axis the percentage of subjects who in all across these different conditions and splitting all the data did answer the questions. You can see a very, very strong main effect of control. Just by adding the, the checkbox, the subjects became much more likely, not just to allow publication, but in fact answer the questions themselves. So if I reframe the first question we had a few minutes ago in terms of can self-regulation protect privacy, you will not be surprised to now see that my personal opinion is uh, I'm not sure, probably not. Let me give you some additional examples for why I have doubts. One is about the problem that, as uh, consumers, we often tend to gratify our, our immediate self and push the cost of our future self. This is well known uh, due to, can be explained through theories of hyperbolic discounting. It's uh, something which happens in many fields of our lives. It does probably happen in privacy because the benefit of information sharing is immediate. The cost of too much information sharing is delayed in time. And to show you how powerful immediate gratification can be, let me use an example which doesn't come from privacy, from another field, but I believe it really brings home the point. My colleague, George Lowenstein, has been doing a CMU, has been doing study on certain drugs that patients have to take regularly, because if they do not take them regularly, not just they become ineffective, they become dangerous, potentially deadly. And you know what? The risk of death is not enough to motivate uh, certain subjects. Even if there is the risk of death, people will not take uh, the little medicine regularly, simply because there is this little but not zero cost of uh, taking the pill every morning. You know what works better? A lottery. 
Making people participate in the lottery if they take the pill increases the probability that subjects will stick to their regime. So death doesn't work, $10 lottery works. And this condition, do you really feel that even people honestly interested in privacy will be likely to protect themselves? Second example, Sisyphus walking up the mountains, uh, bringing the rock, and then the rock falls down again and it starts. Sometimes I feel the privacy is the same. As consumers, once we have learned finally about uh, some privacy invasion te technology, there is a new, more mysterious technology which comes up and we are unprepared to combat it or to defend ourselves against. We learned about cookies, flesh cookies arrive, and so forth and so forth. Why? Well, because actually the industry plays this game very well. Consider Facebook. As much as, I, as we can all be happy about the settlement recently achieved by the FTC, Facebook has a history of uh, pushing the envelope, doing two steps forward, one step back, and then two other steps forward. So one article which came out a couple of days ago was the apologies of Zuckerberg a retrospective. And we was listing the very blog items which appear on Facebook, counting at least 10 instances in which Facebook was uh, regretting and apologizing for something they did with their data, prom promising we will do it again. And then, of course, a few months uh, later, there is another invasion. And then again, uh, some other apologies, some other stories, and so forth. So keep pushing the boundaries over and over. So OK, where do we go from here? Uh, once again, if we believe that privacy has to be protected, and I left this question intentionally open, um, there are three challenges. One challenge is what I call the extremization of the economics of privacy. Another is how we frame the debate on privacy. And the last one is privacy fatalism, another form of frame, a narrative. The narrative that we have convinced people that their data is the price for free content. Can it really be free content if you're paying with your data? So let me discuss these three situations, these three challenges. The extremization of the economies of privacy. I started wondering recently whether collectively, although unintentionally, with the economics of privacy, we have a sort of created a monster. What do I mean by that? The economics of privacy has been so successful that it seems that now, unless you can show a quantifiable economic damage, there is no privacy damage whatsoever. In fact, there is only benefit from information sharing. And no doubt, there are lots of benefits from information sharing. But the challenge here is that maybe by focusing so much on the trade-offs, we have lost uh, the sight on other important dimensions of privacy. Not only that, most of the work on uh, economics of privacy focuses on the things that we as economists can track find tractable, price discrimination, spam, financial damages. But there are so many other things, socially wasteful investment, overinvestment in uh, data acquisition, lower cost of uh, the, uh, privacy invasions, exposed damages, the kind of damages that you realize only later on in time, not just because they are in the long term, but, but also because something else happened that in a way, in coordination with something else created the damage. And sometimes it's difficult to show the causal link the shrinking share of consumer surplus, maybe more and more benefit going from data subjects to data holders. This is somewhat frustrating because we can do better than that. And this is the second challenge. I would say that currently the way the debate is framed, mostly, not always, but mostly, is that the burden of proof falls on the consumer. Show me the damage or be quiet. Prove that there is economic harm, quantifiable, up to $2,500, up to $5,000, depending on what uh, federal legislation you're using. If you cannot, no damage. We can do much better than that. In the sense that privacy technologies, privacy enhancing technology exists, which allow for data to be protected, while data to be shared. Now I know Paul Holm has been uh, a very eloquent researcher in this area, showing the limits of uh, anonymization and the identification, and I agree with him. In fact, part of my work is really about uh, the ability that we have in combining data sets and creating more sensitive information. But I do believe that the combination of privacy and asset technologies and regulatory protection which stops companies from trying to violate the technologies can be quite powerful. 
And if so, then, and this is a, somewhat a provocation, perhaps a strong statement I'm about, I'm about to make, perhaps we should try to change the frame of the debate from that one to this one. We put the burden of proof on the data holders and say, prove me that you really cannot provide the same services in a more privacy protective manner. Prove me the privacy Nancy technologies don't apply to your service, or else uh, be quiet. As for data as a price for free content, that's a way to, that's a narrative, that's a way to frame the debate on the economies of privacy, convince uh, us, the consumers, that all our data is uh, being shared, and that's why we get something free. As an economist, of course, I do not believe in free lunch. Another narrative, which I would say is uh, arguably as, uh, as uh, plausible, is that the Internet is a beautiful marketplace where you can find all sorts of goodies. However, in order to get to the marketplace, first of all, as a consumer, you have to pay a top. You pay your ISP. You go to the airport, uh, you pay the Wi-Fi spot. Once you're paid to reach the market, you reach the market and you offer all sorts of delicious samples, apparently free. But in fact, as you eat them, someone is observing you. There is a data marketing guy there in the back uh, following how you're eating, how much you're eating, what you're tasting, and so forth. And you know what? With all this information, they learn to know you so well that soon enough, you go home with a new Cadillac. And you don't even know why you bought it. Or did I mention you also get to play Angry Birds? <laughs> so, going back to the two questions, one which I didn't try to address, the first one which I sort of tried to address. My belief is that if you simply use uh, economy theory, and I'm about to use a very terrible econ jargon here, is that economy theory provides evidence for both for and against the idea that market outcomes without regulatory intervention can be Pareto inefficient. However, we also have evidence from the empirics of privacy, I believe, which shows that significant hurdles in decision making render self-regulatory approach based on choice and consent uh, just untenable. And if you believe that I'm being too uncharitable in my depiction of uh, us as consumers, I will offer the last piece of evidence. And this is based uh, on uh, something which just happened as early as one week ago. So as early as just uh, seven days ago, many of us, or our fellow countrymen, were willing to uh, get frozen, uh, crushed against uh, glasses, stampeded over, pepper sprayed, Tazard for a $2 Belgian waffle maker. <laughs> and uh, with this picture, which has uh, nothing to do with privacy, but is a great depiction of uh, us as consumers, especially the bliss of the person on the left, uh, everything which makes our economy so great, I rest my case. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>